Welcome, and thank you once again for joining the Braz The Briefing. APCO Worldwide remains a proud sponsor of The Briefing and part of, uh, partner to the Alliance. We think the media plays a critical role in our political and policy process, and we are proud to help in that via these briefings. With that, let me turn it over to my partner in The Briefing, Sarah Dash, who will introduce and moderate this session with our guest, FDA Commissioner Califf. Sarah? Thank you so much, Bill, and uh, really appreciate your support and the rest of your team at APCO Worldwide for making this series possible. And good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back uh, today here with our reporter audience at this Brazda breakfast. Um, well, it's not quite breakfast anymore, but you get the point. Um, as Bill said, I'm Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. If this is your first time at an Alliance reporter briefing, welcome. We're a nonpartisan source for the health policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. And today we are so honored to be joined by Dr. Robert M. Califf, who is Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, where he oversees the full breadth of the FDA portfolio and execution of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and other applicable laws. Dr. Califf has had a long and distinguished career as a physician, researcher, and leader in the fields of science and medicine. He's a nationally recognized expert in cardiovascular medicine, health outcomes research, healthcare quality and clinical research, and a leader in the growing field of translational research. Prior to rejoining the FDA in 2022, Dr. Califf was head of medical strategy and senior advisor at Alphabet Inc., contributing to strategy and policy for its uh, healthcare subsidiaries, Verily Life Sciences and Google Health. And so we're going to begin today's session with a fireside chat. Then we will take your questions. This is an on the record briefing, as you um, all know from having uh, joined here, this session is being recorded. When we get to the Q&A program uh, section of our program, please go ahead and just press the hand and raise um, button at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask a question. And uh, when that button is selected, you'll be placed in a queue uh, to, to ask your question. Um, please do unmute yourself when it's time to state your question and state your name and organization um, that you work for. Um, okay, so welcome, Dr. Califf. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Good to be with you. Thank you. So let's, let's just start with a, kind of an opener. I, this is your second term now as FDA commissioner. Um, and can you remark on how this tenure differs from your previous appointment? And what, what are some of your top priorities for the agency as we look to the fall and into next year? Sure, I, I really do appreciate the question. And I don't think it's a surprise to anyone if I say that the temperature of this time around is about 10 times hotter than 2015, 2016, when I was at the FDA before. Those were exciting times at the end of the Obama presidency, but it was relatively benign compared to the intensity of um, concerns and differences of opinion that are affecting our society, particularly in the health arena. So it, it actually is quite different uh, this time around, and it's been uh, a big adjustment um, as I've gotten into the job. You know, coming into the job, um, it was clear to me that there were some key priorities, the pandemic being number one as I was uh, coming in, and then a lot of concerns about uh, the opioid um, uh, difficulties that we're having as a society with more than 100,000 people dying just in the last year from um, overdose, um, concerns about tobacco. I'm a cardiologist by training. Feel like I've lived, and maybe we'll get into this later, but I've sort of lived through all the eras of tobacco, having had my career at Duke University, which was founded on tobacco money. Um, and now with uh, this far into it, still with 500,000 people a year um, dying. Um, and then uh, I got a number of calls before, uh, during the confirmation process about the food side of the FDA, reminding me that the F stands for food. And a lot of concern, both inside and outside the FDA, that the food side of the FDA had not gotten um, adequate attention. And so that um, has been a priority. I just mentioned two overarching themes that I hope we'll talk about later that coming in, I thought were important. And I think they're even more important now, but they're not sort of the topical um, yes or no questions that we deal with these days. But one of them for sure should be dear to all of you on this call, and that's the issue of misinformation. Um, I've argued that misinformation is actually the leading cause of death in the United States today. 
because we have a lot of effective treatments, um, not necessarily curative, but effective treatments for most of our health problems. But there's so much misinformation causing people to make decisions that are adverse to their health. Um, we have to figure out a way to deal with that. And I hope we'll talk more about that. And then uh, dear to my heart is evidence generation. Um, the way I like to think about it is when FDA makes a decision, um, the amount of controversy is inversely proportional to the quality of the evidence. That is when we've actually generated the right evidence and we have an answer, we can still argue about the meaning of the answer and the policy implications, but that's very different than when the FDA has to make a decision, but the answer is unclear uh, because the right research hasn't been done or hasn't been conducted adequately. And um, all too often we're in that situation and I'm glad to go through um, specific areas that we need to work on there. There are uh, a, li a list of at least 30 other priorities. I won't go through those because I know we want to get to the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. So you talked about two overarching themes, misinformation and evidence generation. I know we're going to want to definitely get into that. And then some, some of the current issues you talked about, the pandemic, uh, the um, opioid crisis, tobacco, and then of course, food. And, um, you know, and then I know there's some, some very much um, not quite day-to-day -day stuff, but the user fee authorizations are, of course, um, top of mind for folks. So let's let's kind of try to take some of these in turn um, as we as we as we talk talk through um, the priorities. I, I want to get your sense of, you know, misinformation. I, I mean, that that um, concern about misinformation. What specifically um, do you see the FDA doing to address misinformation? And um, how do you see the, the, the future trajectory of this issue go? Well, so the, the first two generalizations I'll make is that, you know, I started studying this early in my career because it always struck me in my field of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> we would do a clinical trial that would be definitive. We know the treatment that would save lives. And it still took years to convince everyone to do it. And even then, um, we had naysayers who were often promulgating things that were frankly um, untruthful. And um, so I've been dealing with this. And then, of course, I spent time at Alphabet where I really got to see the broadness of the global picture firsthand. And, all, you know, it's a complex issue that um, I think requires a lot of attention. I think. The second um, perspective I have um, is that I've talked to almost every expert in the world now, as far as I'm concerned. One great thing about being FDA commissioner is when you make a phone call, you almost always get a return call fairly quickly. And we know so much about misinformation now, but I can't find a single expert who would profess that they have a solution to the problem that's going to be successful. And so this is something we've really got to all work on together. Now, as, as it relates to the FDA, um, in the good old days when I was a busy practitioner, FDA would um, assess applications coming in from companies, make decisions, oversee the uh, creation of a label and advertising that was allowed. The advertising and labeling was intended for in, uh, learned intermediaries, physicians, nurses, et cetera. And patients sort of um, were expected to learn about that through the intermediaries. Um, there were some great things about that. It was hierarchical, controllable, but of course it didn't reach a lot of people. A lot of people were left out of that system. We didn't have access. Now we flip entirely the other way. The minute the FDA makes a decision, the entire world can profess about their opinions one way or another. And the average person out there, including, I think, a lot of primary care clinicians are in a, in a sea of information that's very difficult to navigate without the right tools to navigate it. And I think um, we're also in an era where there's so much mistrust of government that it's not something a government agency can fix on its own. So I believe very strongly that, um, although I don't have the whole solution, we're going to need to create networks of very akin to what um, your industry did um, with fact checkers, people who are devoted to reliable, truthful information and spend part of their day um, checking facts, but also um, 
overcoming misinformation on a personal basis because we know the one thing that works best is for a person who's been misled by misinformation to talk to someone they trust and have that person uh, convince them that, um, that there's a different um, answer to the question. But scaling that on a national basis at a time, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop with just one example that I think is just so frustrating and upsetting, uh, and it's the COVID pandemic. We have um, vac vaccines that reduce your risk of dying by 90%, and we have antivirals that reduce your risk of dying if you happen to get infected by another 90%. So very few people should be dying from COVID now, and if you look at the deaths, they're almost all in people who have some combination of age, comorbidity, and are not fully vaccinated. And um, these are all preventable. The treatments are free. They're proven with the highest quality of evidence, randomized trials, real world evidence that um, shows the exact same result as the randomized trials, and even population data showing that if you live in a place with a higher rate of vaccination, your risk of dying is lower. Um, and yet we still can't overcome that and um, and, and get uh, people to take a free treatment that's highly effective. So a lot of work to do. I wish I had a clear, easy answer, but I don't. Mm. But really hearing a call to action here that good information, um, as a matter of fact, can save lives. And that, um, in fact, this audience that's here today, this um, reporter audience can play, play a role in that. Um, I want to uh, I want to just turn to the, the second theme that you mentioned on evidence generation and sort of tie that um, tie that, you know, in some ways, maybe I don't know how, how that ties to the misinformation, but this idea of like having to make decisions in and sometimes a world of imperfect information or changing information, you know, especially with COVID pandemic, you know, so this was new to humanity, literally. So we were learning as we went. What What is needed in your view to, to generate the kind of evidence that the FDA needs to make um, good decisions? I, I think it's a change in our culture um, uh, across the board, and I'd say across the entire ecosystem. But one of the main targets of uh, that I'm focused on is the clinical practice environment uh, that we're in. Remember that um, I was an intensive care unit cardiologist. There you often have to make major life and death decisions with very imperfect information. So it's not that I'm uncomfortable doing it, but as I did it in practice, I was just driven to develop clinical trial systems that work because it's so much better when you make a decision to know that you're making the right decision as opposed to guessing that you might be making the right decision. And um, you know what we've done is we've created a really amazing system for pre-approval clinical trials done by the medical products industry. When it wants to get a product on the market, it's got to do clinical trials. They're very high quality. Um, the answers are generally um, you know, compelling one way or the other. They get the answers that are needed. But it's only limited to safety and efficacy for the intended use in a specific population. Then we put the treatment out there into the real world and all kinds of things happen. Um, and we have whole areas where the evidence is not so good. Uh, and, you know, here's where uh, nutrition and um, tobacco come into play in a major way. And so what we need is a system where everyone is working together to get the evidence we need. And then um, we can all make better decisions that lead to greater health. Now, the details of that, I have a lot of plans. I'm not alone. There are many others who want to pitch in. And I think this is the time to do it. And I'll just pick on one example that many of you were focused on a year ago, uh, Adjuhelm. And you know, remember that um, that was an accelerated approval. One can argue one way or another about whether that was the right decision. Uh, that's not my purpose of bringing it up. But given the decision, the question was, what's a confirmatory trial going to look like? And when it was said it'll take nine years, that created um, a major controversy. And I would say, you know, given an era where people with diseases that are hard to treat expect and hope for accelerated approvals, we need a system that delivers the goods in a much shorter period of time. In a country with the technology and capability we have, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do that. Thank you, Dr. Califf. And I want to ask you one more 
um, kind of overarching question um, before we open it up, because I know that folks are going to have a lot of questions, and we did get some questions in advance that I will also weave in. Um, the FDA has has um, taken steps to increase racial and ethnic diversity in clinical trials, um, and uh, I'm wondering if um, that's something that you can comment on. How is the FDA acting to address uh, health disparities in its work? Well, as I think you know, this has been sort of a lifelong pursuit of mine because I was a clinical trialist in my academic life, and it was always um, seen to be the case that um, if we're going to understand how to use treatments in diverse populations, we'd better study diverse populations. And I think race and ethnicity in this country are at the center of it because of our historical and ongoing issues, and that needs to be a focus. But I'd also add there's other elements of diversity that we also have to consider. We've made tremendous progress with children who were completely left out of clinical trials. And I was part of the movement to um, create laws that uh, required trials in children. I'd argue right now, now that I'm almost 71, tell me the right dose of a drug in an 80-year-old. We, we just don't know because the right studies haven't been done. And a big area of increasing um, um, disparity now is rural America. If you look at our life expectancy as a country, we're now a full five years shorter than the average of other high-income countries. And we're unique. We're a unique outlier. Despite spending almost twice as much money, we're, we're living five years shorter. That is increasingly being driven by a difference between uh, the areas of the U.S. that are urban, the areas that are university towns, and then rural America, where we're seeing a major decline in life expectancy. Now, the NIH has addressed this, um, I think, very effectively, because if you get a grant from NIH, you have to meet the criteria. It's different for FDA because we're, um, uh, we're regulating a global industry where the U.S. is only 4% of the world's population. But um, we are increasingly ratcheting up the guidance, and Congress is interested in um, passing laws that will require the regulated industry since it's still the case that the majority of profit, as you well know, is made in the US, uh, we do have special sway despite being a small part of the world's population. So you can expect us to be focused in on um, diverse populations, but including all the elements of diversity um, that I've discussed. Great. Thank you so much. So um, I wanna now open it up to questions and let me just sort of name some of the categories that I've heard and some of the, the categories of questions that have come in because we could try to kind of keep it somewhat um, succinct um, to, to the extent possible. So, um, you, you know, we've, you mentioned the accelerated approval pathway, and I think there's some questions on that. Certainly, um, folks are interested in the user fee um, uh, authorizations and sort of what, what is going on there with the timing and FDA's sort of plan of action. Um, you um, also mentioned food, tobacco, opioids, and then um, we haven't talked about baby formula, but of course, that's also been, um, you know, certainly on, on people's mind. So let me, um, I'd like to um, invite um, questions. I know, I know folks are going to be interested in around um, the, the, the FDA user fee. And I'll just kind of start with a question that came in and then we'll, we'll, folks can ask follow-up. You know, how will you address potential delays and shortages if the um, FDA user fee reauthorization package is, is held up in the Senate? I'm going to assume that everyone on this uh, call knows that um, if the user fees are not enacted, um, the, the greatest suffering will be from the American people because uh, our public health mission will be injured if we don't have the money to pay employees. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think we've been through this sort of a, a situation before. Now, I do want to say that we've been, and you've heard the public statements from all the elements of the Congress that there is an intention to pass legislation that will fund the FDA uh, before the money runs out. But it's also the case that by about the first week in September, unless we have great assurance that it's either passed or it's about to be passed, we'll have to start notifying um, um, employees who are paid by user fees of impending uh, personnel action because we're really required to. And it's, you know, 
I've worked in all the industries and you owe it to someone to give them um, due notice if problems are going to occur. I, I'm optimistic that we'll um, get through this. Um, brinksmanship is sort of the way it's happened before. Um, but, you know, the consequences on things like new treatments getting assessed uh, with a reasonable timeline be very difficult, um, as you well know, and re really impossible if we don't have the user fee uh, funding to pay the people to to do the work. I, you know, philosophically, I wish the taxpayer paid for all the FDA and there weren't user fees. But um, the reality is um, the user fees exert um, a discipline to the review of applications, which allows one to uh, know full well exactly what it takes um, to assess um, a new treatment that comes along. And this would be greatly um, impaired in addition to our other missions. Thanks. Let me ask you one other operational question and then I'm going to invite folks who have um, user fee questions to um, use the hand raise feature um, um, or if, if, if that it should prove problematic, just go ahead and chat. Um, so th this is kind of an operational question around sort of the pandemic to non-pandemic or post-pandemic, I guess you could say, transition. CBER uh, has said it's working towards returning to normal non-pandemic operations next year. This was a question coming in from Pink Sheet. Do you have a sense or a schedule for the rest of the agency to make a similar move? And what does that even mean? Like, what, what does it mean to sort of, I think we're all figuring it out, but from your perspective, what, what does it mean operationally for for FDA to kind of, you know, get into a post-pandemic um, operating. Uh, well, there's a great uh, diagram on Twitter today that shows each peak, and it says, um, no one could have predicted that. We can relax now. No one could have predicted that. We can relax now. And of course, we're here we are on the BA5 um, peak. And so I'm hesitant to say post-pandemic um, until we really are out of this. I'll just point out, I mean, it's. I think it's an amazing thing. The FDA um, has carried on its enormous pandemic responsibilities and at the same time, taking care of the usual business it um, has to with regard to drugs, devices, biologics, food, cosmetics, all those things. And while it's not perfect, um, this has been through hard overtime weekend work of many people who are many of whom haven't taken a vacation in over two years. And um, it's it's really quite a remarkable thing for me to drop into and, uh, and see in motion. So what I'd say is that our strategy is, um, you know, I learned a lot out in Silicon Valley about people that are dealing with data and the different types of jobs that are done. And I'd say our strategy is to look at what is the optimal work environment for each subcomponent of the FDA, not just by center, but also by function. For example, people that work in laboratories have always been going to the laboratory. Um, investigators who do inspections, they're on the road. They've already put themselves at risk. And as we get more and more comfortable with the status of vaccination protection from severe illness, um, you know, they're returning to normal activity pretty much across the board. People are dealing with data. Um, or who are doing administrative functions are going to live in a hybrid environment where we uh, optimize the work um, for the productivity and the job satisfaction, remembering that we're in a competitive environment in the middle of the great resignation still. And so we got we to gotta offer good employment. But, um, you know, I have to say I'm impressed by the work ethic. So the, the answer is there is no clear demarcation, but measure us by the work that by the job that we do and the degree to which we fulfill our functions. Yes, thank you. You're you're dealing with many of the same same trends that um, other businesses and um, agencies and nonprofits are. Um, so we have some questions and I've go I went I'm put in the chat and please forgive my just using your first names but just wanted to try to keep myself honest here in terms of the order of questions. Um, we'll hear from Produce, um, Al Farouk and then Cheryl Stolberg and then Christina Jewett and then Elizabeth Short. Um, Produce, you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Thank you. This is Produce al uh, I go by Danny, uh, with Regulatory Focus. Dr. Califf, um, you were talking about the user fees. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a little bit about how much carryover funds uh, the various user fees uh, have and how long FDA can continue to run 
the user fee programs if Congress does not pass um, a reauthorization. Uh, I was also curious about the uh, appropriations uh, bills. Uh, those have not been complete yet. If they do not meet their deadlines, what does that mean for the FDA in terms of um, uh, continuing its operations? How long can FDA continue critical operations without those funds? Well, let me start with the last part of the question. I mean, um, it would be unheard of for Congress not to um, pass some kind of continuing resolution if they're not um, going to do the full um, package. And I think uh, everyone at FDA has gotten used to that. Um, given all the work that's gone into the um, specifications, um, you know, in next year, in, in this year and next year's budget, it would be a shame if we're on continuing resolution, but we can continue our operations. We've shown that before, just um, not to the same extent on some of the uh, programs that are very high priority. On, on the user fees, you know, I don't want to get into details of specific dollar amounts. I, I'll just say um, that, you know, by early September, uh, we're going to begin to see issues. We have a number of employees that are we're trying to hire. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked for the federal government, but the hiring system in the federal government is not quite the nimble system I got used to at Alphabet. Um, there are many regulations that cause there to be multiple checks and balance that take time. And we don't want to discourage all the people that are currently looking for jobs that may have other um, opportunities. And I think the experience in the past, if things drag on, you know, into September is that we'll start losing steam because we won't have as many people. Uh, we won't be hiring in the new people. And then um, it takes a long time to recover from that in the federal system. So rather than getting into specific dollar amounts, that's sort of the, I, th I think you get the general picture there. Thanks, Dr. Califf. Um, so um, we'll go to Cheryl Stolberg next. Hi, thanks for doing this call, Dr. Califf. I'm Cheryl Stolberg from the New York Times. And I wonder if you could address broadly the criticism that the federal government has been too slow to respond to the monkeypox outbreak, and in particular, criticism that uh, the FDA waited too long to uh, approve that Bavarian Nordic fill finish facility. I know that the secretary said it was expedited, but I have heard criticism that it took way too long. Well, I, I hesitate to speak for the whole federal government in terms of the monkeypox response. I mean, we're all concerned about it, very concerned about it. Um, the number of cases is growing. Um, it's it's a um, it, it it's a very difficult um, disease to treat, given the fact that it hasn't been around in large numbers. You know, it's not a new disease, but it's not a disease that um, we've been dealing with in our uh, traditional um, health system. So I just say that we're uh, continuing to ramp up um, our efforts, and and you'll hear a lot more about this uh, increasingly until we get it. Uh, under control. What I'd say about uh, the Bavarian Nordic um, situation, I think we moved very fast considering that um, we had a, a, a manufacturing plant that had to be inspected. It was done, um, you know, much faster than um, had been planned. And then we had to make sure that the product that was being produced was in fact um, active because, and uh, in, in according to specs, because the only thing worse than not having a vaccine is having a vaccine which is widely distributed and is not effective. So, um, you know, I would stand by our uh, record with that vaccine. And as you also know, um, because we uh, were hopeful that it would pass all the specs, we arranged to have it flown over while we were finishing um, all of the uh, inspection and regulatory activities that had to be uh, done before it should be given to people. So it was ready to go uh, on the day that um, it, it did uh, get cleared uh, by the FDA. Thanks. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. We'll go to Christina Jewett now. Christina, if you're ready, you can unmute and ask yeah, a question. Sorry, I was toggling. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, 
what your priorities are in the tobacco realm? What do you see as sort of the important next things to tackle? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. I, you know, as I said, I grew up uh, in an institution that was uh, originally funded by um, the first mass production of cigarettes. Um, at, at, you know, and that that was the money that founded Duke University, or at least a big part of it. Um, I was a practicing cardiologist in intensive care. I saw many, many people die at, and have disability from tobacco-related illness. Um, and then uh, my first tour through, uh, we were sort of at the end of a of the startup of the tobacco center. They were heady times when we were talking about policy, but many of the regulatory and enforcement activities had not started. And um, in between stents, um, things did get revved up um, and a lot of regulatory action has been taken. I don't think anyone anticipated that when vaping, which was deemed under my watch in 2016, as something we would regulate, I don't think anyone anticipated there would be 6.7 million vaping products that would have to be dealt with. And then, of course, now with the synthetic nicotine, in a very short period, period of time, that industry came up with one over 1 million um, synthetic nicotine products. Now, so, um, you know, Mitch Zeller just retired um, after a, um, a stint as the head of the Tobacco Center. He deserves a lot of credit. He was there with David Kessler in those early days when they discovered all of the um, work that the tobacco companies were doing to get people addicted to nicotine. And he got us to a certain place, but we're entering a new era now where we really have to focus on several things. One is um, completing the regulatory activity and the enforcement. Um, a second is um, the issue of menthol where the the decisions on menthol vaping have been deferred. A third is um, uh, the area of um, uh, in, going forward with the um, rules about um, cigars and menthol cigarettes. And then, of course, we have on the common agenda the reduction of nicotine um, in the product itself to a subaddictive level as a goal. Uh, this is going to be a very different era, and I'm really glad we recruited Brian King in to uh, be head of the Tobacco Center. He's only two weeks into it, so uh, but he's a very clear thinker and a very clear um, speaker. You're going to hear a lot more from us about um, exactly how we need to do these things. Uh, you're also aware that we're doing a top-to-bottom review of the Tobacco Center because all of this is going to take changes. That center is full of really hardworking people who I think did an amazing job with 6.7 million applications in the middle of a pandemic with a lot of help from others at the FDA. But we got to look carefully at the operations and our relationship with other government entities um, to make sure that um, we're going to get the job done. One last thing I want to mention that's very important to me. If you look at the 30 million Americans who are currently using tobacco, not the vapors, which is a, a very important uh, group too, particularly the teenagers, but those currently using tobacco, um, they're a group of people who are going to need help as we try to get them off of tobacco, 500,000 of them dying per year. Um, and uh, we need a better package, a care package for them as they come off of um, tobacco and nicotine addiction that enables them uh, to do it in a way which is not um, harmful to the rest of their lives. This is this is actually much more difficult than I would have thought until I got involved in it in 2016, but we're going to work on it with a lot of diligence. Thanks, Dr. Califf. And we had had some questions come in about tobacco. So I'll just ask, um, this had come in from MedPage Days. Uh, Apparently, we're almost about a year past the September 9th, 2021 deadline regarding other pre market tobacco products. And, you know, how does the FDA plan to release their rulings um, in terms of uh, the individual examination of remaining tobacco electronic cigarette products? Or is that part of what we'll be hearing about with um, this new team on board? <laughs> um, well, I, um, this is just part, this is my personal philosophy here about one part of this. I think when it comes to tobacco, the, the public opinion court is going to be very important in addition to the enforcement. 
I've already, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, you asked the right, uh, you qualified it, I think, correctly. Um, part of the reason for the top-down review is we, we need to optimize our internal operations and our communications to make sure that we are uh, transparent and that we're not surprising people with what we do and that people understand the reasons we're doing um, what we're doing. No matter what we do in tobacco, there will be major disagreements and people with very strong opinions on one side or the other. So we have to be uh, transparent and clear um, uh, in our communications. But if we really look at it, you know, we're seeing a reduction in use of tobacco. We're not seeing that big a reduction in death because the remaining smokers tend to um, have other medical problems and um, other difficulties. For example, um, almost 100% of people with serious um, mental uh, illness disorders um, use tobacco. And so um, I, I think um, a greater understanding on society um, about not getting addicted to nicotine for teenagers and not uh, and taking advantage of ways to get off of tobacco um, as we enact the enforcement and all the other things that we're going to do. I think that's equally as important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you talked about those comorbidities too being a risk factor for COVID. So it all kind of ties together, if, if we're not mistaken. I think that's a you know, um, theme in our society. I just want to mention that it relates to a lot of what we need to do. Um, the comorbidities tend to glom together. And if you look at mm -hmm. this five-year difference in life expectancy that we have with other high-income countries, there's a constellation of metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, um, uh, and, and mixed in with um, mental uh, difficulties and suicide as a key factor. And uh, since they tend to glom together, if we work on one part of it, we can help another part. For example, in the diet, in the nutrition area, um, reducing obesity will not only reduce cardiovascular disease, but it has a huge effect on cancer. As, as we'll be talking about more with the cancer moonshot. Thank you all. Great points. And uh, I know there's a lot more to talk about. So I want to um, keep us keep us moving here. Um, just want to, when you spoke about suicide, just want to remind everyone the 988 mental health crisis line is now is now live. And um, of course, that's a separate topic of conversation, but kind of worth mentioning here. Um, Okay, we still have a lot of things to cover. I want to get to Elizabeth and then Nick and then Max uh, for your questions. Thanks. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask for some brief clarification. Um, when you said that we need a system that delivers the goods in a shorter period of time, I just wanted you to clarify what uh, specifically you meant by that. And I also, after that, if I could just move to baby formula, um, if we could talk about how with foreign companies now being allowed to sell in the US, um, how does the FDA plan to handle the inspections of those plants and products, uh, given that we recently reported staffing shortages? Thank you. Um, let me just say, um, by delivering the goods, I mean, doing good um, clinical trial, I, I think you're referring to the evidence generation system. Um, doing good clinical trials more quickly embedded in clinical practice. And I point to the recovery group in the UK during the pandemic as a really good example. It's well known that I've collaborated with the Oxford group for years, and we sort of had a co-opetition thing but with us, uh, the groups that I've led in North America doing similar kinds of trials. But um, the idea is if we can um, embed clinical trials in clinical practice, enroll a lot of people in the health systems and use um, streamlined systems that we can get answers much faster with larger sample sizes. Um, and, and, you know, they've done that with regard to COVID, uh, it answered a number of questions very quickly, um, while the more complicated trials often didn't get the answers because they were so complicated, uh, it was very hard to enroll people in those trials. With regard to uh, infant formula, we're already inspecting uh, foreign plants. It does turn out, if you look at um, the enforcement discretion um, uh, decisions that we've made, um, there's still a limited number of manufacturers, including the foreign ones. Um, some of the incumbent manufacturers in the US had foreign plants that have gotten enforcement discretion. And so we fully intend to um, inspect those plants 
uh, just as frequently as the U.S. plants, because this is if, if there's one thing we've all learned from this is infant formula is a critical medicine. Basically, it's a sole source of nutrition for a lot of infants. We can't have a system which is so dependent on just a few plants making most of the formula. We have to have a resilient system and they have to be very high quality. You know that there's uh, funding at stake right now in some of the legislation. We do need more people, but we're just going to uh, beg, steal, and borrow from parts of the FDA until um, we, we get uh, this one right, including the foreign plants. So there are inspections going on right now uh, in some of those plants. Thanks, Dr. Califf. Um, we'll move to Nick uh, Fiorco now, and then um, we'll go to Fiona, and then um, Max Bayer, and then Celine. Nick? Great. Thank you, Dr. Califf, for doing this. Uh, I also had a question about tobacco regulation, uh, specifically about synthetic tobacco. Uh, so tobacco control advocates and lawmakers have openly urged the FDA to sweep the market of uh, synthetic products who filed PMTAs while the FDA considers those applications, especially given the youth use of those products. Uh, without asking you about specific applications, can you give us all a sense of why the FDA hasn't decided to take that tactic and clear the market of products pending review? Uh, and can you give us a sense of whether the FDA believes it even has the authority to take that sort of sweeping action while applications are pending? Um Nick, let, let's, just for the purposes of um, thinking about it, let's divide it into those who didn't even submit an application and those who did submit an application. Remember the timeline, as you well know, was very short. And so um, I think the, the, the most straightforward case is uh, the company that didn't even submit an application. They're clearly not um, legally on the market um, and there's nothing pending. And so, um, uh, that that's that's a that's one that um, we've got to really um, focus on. Those that have submitted an application, um, what what I'll say is um, we want to act, um, but we have a lot of things to work through to get to the point where that can happen. Including uh, we have a burden of proof. Um, one great thing about the U.S. is that everyone has um, recourse to. Um, uh, have their day in court or, and so we have to collect the evidence and have the proof before we can do anything. And then, as you know, the FDA doesn't have independent enforcement capabilities on a broad national scale. That would take a very large workforce. So um, one thing you can expect of this 90 day um, review that we're doing, the 60 day review, 60 working day review is um, we're, we're going to have a plan for enforcement that will acknowledge what the issues are and how we plan to deal with them. So you're asking the right question. Um, and uh, we got work to do to have uh, what, an answer that I'm completely happy with. Hmm. Thanks, Dr. Califf. And let's go to um, now, let me, sorry, make sure that I have this correct, <laughs> the order correct. Um, Fiona, please. Hi, thank you for doing this and for taking my question. Um, I have two questions, one on vaccines and one on misinformation. Um, the first, um, there has been some disappointment over the durability of the currently available vaccines. What, what is the FDA doing to encourage vaccine makers to look beyond the spike protein and instead focus on the development of second generation vaccines to provide longer lasting protection? Well, before we get too disappointed though, let's also keep in mind that tens of millions of lives have been saved. And even most recently, the, the fourth booster, there are now five studies showing um, around an 80% reduction in the rate of death and hospitalization and no uh, uptick in adverse events. So while it's um, no fun getting jabbed more frequently, the vaccines are basically working. And I, you know, my number one plea is that people take advantage of um, the freedom from being in the hospital and dying that these vaccines afford us. Now, we're all encouraging um, the scientists, the NIH, and the vaccine manufacturers to develop vaccines that uh, may be more pan 
coronavirus. As you know, there are also many efforts underway um, uh, to develop things like nasal vaccines that may protect us against getting infected, since the main benefit of vaccines currently is not protection from infection, but protection from serious illness. Um, you know, the big question is, um, can the industry do it on its own, or will there be additional uh, federal funding? And I think you're aware that there's an active debate going on uh, with Congress um, about that. And um, I think it's totally within the um, realm of possibility scientifically that better vaccines can be developed. It's just going to take time. Thank you. And um, one quick question. Does the FDA plan to get on TikTok at all as part of your misinformation strategy? There have been, um, you know, a lot of reports on health and medical misinformation being spread on that platform. And that's probably um, likely to increase given monkeypox and boosters in the fall. So any plans for that? Um, we don't have definite plans at this point, but let's say we're looking at all possibilities and you can't ignore TikTok in today's environment. I have two 18 year old grandkids who are starting college uh, next month, and I think they're on TikTok all the time if I'm interpreting things correctly. <laughs> uh, personally, I'm not. <laughs> Dr. Caleb, I would love to follow up real quickly on that question as, as someone who um, is not on TikTok because there, there's only so much bandwidth in the day here, but um, just more broadly, I mean, like the FDA's ability to do marketing and sort of targeted, you know, campaigns. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, you know, because I think sometimes that's sort of seen as like uh, maybe superfluous, but if you're talking about battling misinformation, um, I was just wondering if there's anything you wanted to sort of add as to your sort of operational capacity there more sure. broadly. I mean, after my first stand, as part of my standard lecture was reminding people that right there on the mission page of the FDA is giving um, people um, information that allow, enables them to use products safely and effectively. And but we have very limited um, internal capabilities, a very uh, limited budget, and we have to be very careful because we're like referees in a sports event. We can't pick winners and losers based on who we like. We only, winners and losers win and lose by playing by the rules of the game, which we right. adjudicate. But having said that, with clear misinformation that's harmful to the public, I think we do have a responsibility to both uh, but be proactive and anticipate and also reactive when necessary to um, to deal with it. But I go back to what I said earlier, which is this is way too big for FDA to deal with alone. We need all of you and we need the academic and university communities to be actively engaged in combating mm. uh, misinformation. Yeah, thank you. Um, our, we have 12 minutes left. I want to get to Max. He's been very, very patient. And then Christina, uh, excuse me, then Celine. Um, and um, I do want to ask you about um, food, Dr. Kilif, as well, before we wrap up. So Max, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, God, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Kalif, for, for hosting this. Um, you mentioned some of your accelerated approval uh, proposals at the top. Also, Dr. Pazder has been on the record as wanting to maybe limit uh, the use of single arm trials in some of these uh, proposals uh, for, for new cancer therapies. The biopharma industry has come out against these, saying that they're going to limit the time it takes for drugs to get to market, limit innovation. What's your response to some of these critiques? And, and just sort of wondering if you're going to put any of these sort of policies in, in concrete uh, proposals and drafts. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, I love this stuff. So this is this is like the bread and butter of my career. And, and I would just say one of the beauties of the system is that the FDA employees who make these decisions are um, civil servants who have no, comp no um, financial conflicts of interest of any kind. Me, I, I don't have financial conflicts either at this point, but I am a political appointee. They are not. And so um, and so that leads me to the point that every situation is different. And so while we have general rules, uh, and I think one of the flavors of difference is if you have a rare disease that's uh, highly lethal and there is no effective treatment, um, then a single arm study can make a lot of sense. If you have a disease for which there's an effective treatment, 
um, but something you know super might be coming along, then I think you have a very different situation. It's just one example to consider. And and um, you know I'd also point out that um, if you do a set of studies and you really can't tell whether the treatment is effective, you've uh, been I, I think ethically questionable with regard to human subjects. And and so we we need to get it right from the beginning. Um, and and you know I think this will evolve. In other words, the more diseases for which we have some treatment, the more sense it makes to act more like mainstream, where you do uh, proper control, randomized trials to make sure you get a definitive answer. So um, I wish we had three hours to talk about this. I think it's a really important topic, and we got to get it right because we still have thousands of rare diseases with no effective treatments. And we have many chronic diseases that are leading to this decline in, li in life expectancy that we're now seeing where we have amazingly promising um, opportunities where accelerated pathways make sense as long as we can get the answer um, quickly in the post-market phase. I just wanna make sure I'm picking up what you're putting down there, which is that you know maybe oncology is sort of a space where the accelerated approval uh, pathway is being maybe I don't want to say taken advantage of, but you're sort of saying that it's, maybe there are other areas where it could be better utilized. I wouldn't say better. I think oncology is still right, but I just want to give Dr. Pastor credit. I think he's, as a single person, had an enormous effect in transforming a field. And cancer is one area where we're not seeing a decline in life expectancy. We're seeing an increase, I think, because of his work. But I think he's just recognizing uh, that because it's been successful, now cancer, um, in many cases, needs to move into a new phase because there are effective treatments for many kinds of cancer. But there are also many kinds of cancer for which they're not. So we're just saying you got to look at each case and make the best decision. And I can't think of anybody better than people who have no conflict of interest but are, uh, have a mission of public health for Americans. Thanks, Dr. Hill. Well, if you if you have three hours, we'll host it and we can talk we can talk about it some more. Um, let me uh, move to Celine now, and then um, if we have time, Christopher, Christina can ask the second question. Go ahead, Celine. Hi, thank you, Celine Castronovo from Bloomberg Law. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to specifically ask on opioids. I know you committed to a comprehensive review of opioid regulations and said recently that the public would be hearing more about this soon. So I was wondering if you had any updates to provide now on either the timeline of that review or what specific areas you plan to focus on. Um, what, I, what I'd say is um, we'll be coming out with a statement which won't be the final review, but it'll be um, basically our plan, which will um, is extensive and has multiple work streams. Um, and I, I just, uh, I'll try to be quick here because uh, I want to give Christina a chance to ask her question. But let me just say, um, you know, we have the old problem of opioid addiction, which is still there and still needs to be dealt with. And we have multiple avenues that we need to address for that. You know, for example, um, education of prescribers still needs work, naloxone accessibility. Those are just two of many examples. Um, and then we have the new form, which I, I hope you all will write a lot more about. There has been press on it, but um, the super synthetic fentanyl and methamphetamine that's being sold um, essentially in the mail to often to teenagers who are, think they're getting a party pill um, uh, has got to be dealt with. And that's a very different situation than a prescribed mm -hmm. opioid being misused. Um, um, you know, from the medicine cabinet and um, it is a very serious problem that's growing at this point. I mean, the potency of fentanyl through chemical synthesis is, um, is, is very, very high and often not amenable to standard doses of naloxone. So we got to pay more attention to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, within, you know, during the month of August, you'll see a very comprehensive um, framework that will come out with that will give you a lot to talk about uh, mm. because almost every, uh, just one other thing to say about it, there is no magic bullet. All the work we've done says there are, you know, dozens of things that need to be done. Each one is incremental, but if they're all done together, um, they could have a big impact. And especially um, we need uh, 
almost every one of them involves collaboration with either some other federal entity or some part of the private sector or a change in uh, the statutory framework from Congress. So we're going to have a lot of work um, to do on it. Yeah. And let me ask you, Dr. Califf, thank you, you, you know, because you, you mentioned tobacco, we've talked about opioids, and, um, you know, you had also mentioned the need to prioritize food safety and um, safety of the food supply. You've recently ordered an external review of the F FDA's offices for food safety. I just wonder if you could comment briefly on that as well, and then we'll turn to Christina for her question. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I got a bunch of calls as I was going through confirmation about the food side of the FDA. I sort of, when I last time through, I had the luxury of Steve Ostroff had been the acting commissioner before me, and he filled out role of deputy commissioner for food. And um, the structure got changed um, after I left. And people have been focused on the structure, but um, I'm here to say that structure and leadership are only part of the issue. Um, we need, um, better funding. Uh, we need hiring authority to get the best uh, people. And we need to look at the, you know, in this modern era, the functionality. I'm sitting here in North Carolina, it's going to be 95 degrees at five o'clock this afternoon. If you think the way we're currently growing food is going to feed the world, um, I'd say you're out of your mind. We, this, the future of agriculture, food, nutrition, is at stake now and the FDA has a major role. So we're gonna mm. come out with a different plan to deal with it that'll include all those elements. Yeah, and climate change is real, it's worth saying. So um, thank you. So um, let's turn to Christina for a very brief question because I wanna give Dr. Hill a chance to um, give uh, a couple closing thoughts. Christina? Yeah, thanks for indulging me, I appreciate it. Um, your testimony to Congress was really, um, you know, gripping about the situation inside the Abbott um, Nutrition Factory in Michigan, and I was just wondering if you have a sense of what that looks like, like right now. I do. We we are, um, as you know, there's a consent decree with Abbott, and I do want to emphasize as a cardiologist, I, I also testified about this. For my whole career, I've worked with Abbott products and they've been, you know, fantastic, life-saving in many cases and the work that I've done as a clinician. So I was very disappointed by that plant. But in the consent decree, we're essentially there with Abbott. Um, they have totally redone the plant, um, the floor, the ceiling, um, you know, and as you also know, we had this amazing stroke of bad luck right after I said, unless there's a catastrophe, we're getting in good shape and the next day there was a flood first one in the history of um Sturgis Michigan uh to that extent so it had to all be redone again but um they're they're doing a great job as I would expect Abbott to do um I don't know you know why it happened the way it did but um I'm very confident about the status of that plant at this point having said that we can't let the industry get back to the point where we have essentially two facilities were responsible for half of the country's infant formula production. So we have to diversify. And that's part of what we're doing through bringing in um, foreign manufacturers, but there are also many people who want to build facilities in the US and a thriving industry here. So it's going to take a little while to get all this adjusted and get the market back to where it needs to be. But um, I'm very confident that we're going to get there. And I think the good news now is people can find infant formula. We're not where we need to be. Still have a lot of work to do. I'm in meetings every day and every weekend day about it to make sure that we're staying on top of it. Thank you, Dr. Califf. You, you've certainly um, given us a sense of the incredible breadth of uh, the FDA's mission, uh, your portfolio, um, and then the, the incredibly uh, life life and death uh, truly issues that that you're dealing with every day. I wonder in the final minute that we have if there's anything um, sort of any, any final um, parting words you'd like to impart on us. Well, I'm not looking for sympathy and my uh, wife reminds me every day that I chose to come back. I had no reason to have to come back, but um, at age 70, um, when asked looking at the situation, I knew there were going to be some very hard things to do that it was gonna take someone with a strong ego and not much at stake in terms of future career because I consider this to, um, I keep saying this, to most likely be my last job. And so, um, but what I, what I am looking for and hopeful for from you is that you'll help with this misinformation issue 
And um, I, I think one of the most gripping things I've heard, um, I did go to the COVID spreader event of the correspondence uh, meeting. Trevor Noah's um, speech there, I think is one of the most gripping speeches that I've heard. And I hope that you'll consider that as you think about the reporting that you're doing, because I'm increasingly worried that there's a difference between um, news and information that's increasingly hard for you all to navigate um, because you're you're living in a different environment, just like the environment I described for um, health information in general. So I'm not picking on you. You have every right to criticize us. I know you will. But um, I hope as you look at it through the lens of what your effect is on public health, which can be um, quite considerable. So th thanks for giving me the chance to um, speak a little bit. And I hope this has been helpful as you think about the work that we're doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Califf. I think it's been incredibly um, helpful and, and truly informative. And, and uh, we, we appreciate you and I'm happy to have you back anytime. Um, thank you again to, um, to Bill Pierce and the team at APCO Worldwide. And um, Dr. Califf, I'll give you one more chance. I'll give you, I'll give you a chance to just say some, one thing about the, the, the civil servants at the FDA because I get to ride the Metro home and I see those signs, that posters that say, come work with us. So um, we'll, we'll close out sort of one minute late with, um, you know, what's your, uh, your hiring pitch? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I've told everybody this, when I went back in 2015 as a civil servant, it was a empowering and freeing event to know that your mission was the well being of the, of the people of the United States. I mean, that is such a clarifying mission to have. And I think people, when they get up and go to work at the FDA, they have that mission in mind. It's easy to lose your sense of centeredness given all the controversy and all the issues that come up but what a great place to work with a clear mission and we are working on a tremendous work environment too i'll add so if any of you might uh, be interested in a job we've got openings and uh, we're looking that's awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Caleb. Thanks to all of you um, for uh, spending your afternoon with us here. Thanks again to Bill um, and um, thanks uh, as well to certainly all of the public servants at the FDA. Um, we appreciate you and um, we look forward to our next opportunity to get together. Thank you. You take care. Take care.